Today we're going to talk, we're going to take a little break, start with that, we're going to take a little break from uh, the history of the church per se and talk about uh, a saint. However, it is a saint from the time period that uh, Ed told us about in the last two weeks, um, the early Christians. Uh, we're talking about uh, the period of uh, around 300 A.D. Um, I'm sure you've never heard of him. Okay, I'd be amazed if any of you have heard of St. Marcellus, the Roman centurion. Um, but it's really an amazing story. Um, so uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. St. Marcellus who was... Um, a military martyr. St. Marcellus was uh, born in the uh, mid-3rd century A.D. He died in 298 A.D. in Morocco. He is honored in both the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. And he was canonized pre-congregation, meaning, remember, that uh, Ed told you that uh, before um, there were actual formal churches uh, and, and community uh, services, masses, and so on, it was all in the family. This was the period in which St. Marcellus was canonized. His major shrine is in the church of San Marcelo in Leon, Spain. And this is an amazing part, and nobody can really explain it, at least not in the literature. The relics ended up within the altar of the Basilica of Sacred Heart at Notre Dame University in Indiana. And I tried, I really tried to find out how did they get there? And why would they go there? And here was a, a, an important saying for that region in Spain. Why would Notre Dame University have the relics? I found no answer. So, take it for what it's worth. His feast day is celebrated on October 30th with a couple of his sons, and we'll have that story in a little bit. And he is remembered for being martyred for refusing to worship Roman gods. So who was he? Well, I'm accustomed in presenting to you, I usually like to go to the early years. There are no early years for St. Marcellus. It's amazing. They, they really took a lot of time. They documented everything that happened in his last few days, if you want to call it that way, maybe last few months. But there's nothing about his childhood or his uh, paternal, maternal family. We clearly know what he did 
and what happened uh, to him as a result of what he did. He was a Roman centurion stationed in Tangiers. And here's the key. Okay, Tangiers, Northern Africa. <laughs> Once you became a Roman centurion, you were a Roman centurion for life. Okay, right. Once a Marine, you're always a Marine. Well, in this case, however, it meant a little more. You couldn't just say, I don't want to be a Roman centurion anymore. You were stuck with it. Until the point where you couldn't do your duties, you were too old, too fragile, or you got sick and you couldn't do your duties. But as long as you could do your duties, you were a Roman centurion and you couldn't resign. Marcellus was uh, married to Nona, his wife, and he had 12 sons. 12. The names Claudius, Lupercus, Victorius, Facundus, Primitivus, Servandus, Germanus, Faustus, Januarius, Martial, Emeterius, and Celadonius. And the reason I tell you these names is because as we go on with the story, those names become important, bring up more questions. Marcellus was converted to Christianity after, after he was a Roman centurion. Now that was a problem. The Roman Empire was um, not accepting, but at least if you said, I can't be a Roman centurion, I cannot be enlisted because I'm a Christian and I don't believe in what you guys do. Generally, the answer was, okay, so be it. We'll get another one. But if you were a Roman centurion and you said, I don't want to be a Roman centurion anymore because I'm a Christian, that was not good. In fact, it was not allowed. In the Roman Empire, again, many Christians refused to serve in the imperial armies due to a conflict that they viewed in their baptismal vows in the teachings of Jesus. And the Roman Empire put up with it. But once you became a centurion, you were a centurion for life. Marcellus refused to render worship to the Emperor Diocletian, and in public, he denounced such celebration as heathen in public. Not good. He was immediately sentenced to be beheaded. Now, if you go into the encyclopedias and the Book of Saints and etc., 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 in the same time frame, a little bit later, more in the 308 A.D. time frame, there was another Marcellus. But this was Pope Marcellus I. <clears throat> and I didn't want you guys to, you know, I, I wanted you guys to see the difference between the two. During the same general time frame of Marcellus, the Roman centurion, Pope Marcellus I rose to reign the Catholic Church. That happened in 308 AD, 10 years after Marcellus actually was beheaded, Marcellus the centurion. 
It was a period of great confusion within the church when the emperor and the high officials um, demanded immediately that the pope allow those who were outside the church to come into the church. Even if they have despised the church, the emperor said, I'm the emperor, and I deserve to be allowed in. Well, Pope St. Marcellus said, um, not really. Um, I won't give you blanket re-entry into the church without penance and absolution. Well, the emperor didn't like that very much. So, the miffed emperor, Emperor Maxentius, forced Pope Marcellus to slavery. He actually sent him to work in barns outside of Rome, almost like a slave. And he was prohibited from giving any sacramental uh, uh, activities of any kind okay, to any of the farmers, the neighbors. He wasn't supposed to function as a priest, period. That was part of his slavery's exile and so on. But that's okay. In you know, within six or seven months of this, the emperor thought, well, you know, this guy deserves to come back. So let's take him back in Rome. But in getting them back to Rome, they found out a woman farmer that had a baby. And Marcellus, as a priest, baptized him. No, 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 for the Roman Empire. You disobeyed us. So they sent them out again, this time, to clean after horses. Again, slavery. This was in 309 AD, so he had only been a pope for a year. And this time, this period of service, um, killed him. Uh, he ended up with health problems and, and died. He was not a martyr. Okay, so he was not killed by the empire, but almost. Okay, he died in slavery. So, I just wanted to make sure that you understood this is not the saint that we're talking about. So how did Marcellus the centurion get into trouble? And there's this amazing amount of information from here to his death. Nothing before, but from here to his death, really well recorded. One day in 298 AD, uh, again during the reign of Emperor Diocletian, Marcellus' unit in North Africa was celebrating the pagan emperor's birthday in a party, or with a party. So they were, you know, sacrificing to the gods, the Roman gods. And oh, by the way, remember from the story, the emperors were part of the gods. Marcellus rose before the banqueter, banqueters and denounced the celebration as heathen. So in front of that, in front of the emperor, in front of all of the high-ranking officials, the Roman centurions and so on, he decided to make a declaration. He casted off his military insignia and he cried out, I serve Jesus Christ, the eternal king. I will no longer serve your emperors or your gods of wood and stone. 
how do you think that was uh, regarded? That obviously did not go well. Marcellus was immediately arrested for breach of discipline. At his trial, he admitted to have done what he was accused of. He said, not right for a Christian who serves Jesus Christ to worship other gods. Plain and simple. He was found guilty and immediately beheaded. And according to the ancient testimonies, which are recorded, he died in great peace of mind, asking God to bless the judge who had condemned him. Now what's amazing is the recording of his passion, per se. Well documented by a close friend. So let's take a look in some detail at Marcellus's passion. After he denounced the emperor in public, Marcellus threw his centurion insignia and sword to the ground, an indication, I want no part of this anymore. You couldn't do that as a Roman centurion. Lucius, his friend and fellow soldier, begged him to take back his sword. And Marcellus was recorded to respond, I cannot. You know I cannot. Christ is my commander now, and I will not betray him. Talk about guts. Lucius pleaded with him that this would not end well. You will pay with your life. But Marcellus once again answered him, My life is a small thing. Since my Lord has surrendered his life for me, can I now withhold my own? Marcellus was arrested, and he appeared before Lord Agricolanus, the vice praetorian prefect. The record reads that Marcellus was, quote, a Christian who could not observe his oath unless to Christ, son of the living God. Agricolanus asked him, did you do those things which are recorded in the official record? Now, Marcellus could have come up with a story. Well, I didn't mean it. Well, you know, I was maybe going nuts. Uh, I, I was hungry. Uh, whatever. Marcellus just answered, I did. Agricolanus followed with, What madness possessed you to cast aside your oath and say such things? And listen to the response from Marcellus. No madness possesses him who fears God. And then Marcellus added, I am a Christian. And I call only upon the true God and King, Jesus Christ, whom I love more than all honor and riches of this world. And further, I will no longer sacrifice to gods and emperors and disdain to worship your wooden and stone gods who are deaf and dumb idols. Well, Agricolanus just said, enough, this man should die by the sword. Going back to Lucius, Marcellus's friend and fellow soldier, 
he recorded his passion and closed the record with the following words. And listen to this. Marcellus was martyred for the cause of Christ and Christian conscience on that very day. His heart was steadfast and valiant. He did not fear death, nor was life taken from him, but was changed into a better one. With that act, Marcellus produced within me a desire to know his master and to take the conf his confession upon myself. And Lucius's final words were, I do not know if others will follow this path Marcellus has forged, but I am ready now to lay down my own sword and call upon the true God and King, Jesus Christ. Now, if you think the story of Marcellus the Centurion is a sad story, it gets worse. Marcellus did not go down by himself. After his death, Marcellus's wife, Nona, and all of his 12 sons were decapitated. There is no recording as to why this happened, but by following similar stories, you could envision that they were each asked to denounce their father's, husband's actions, but they declined to do so one by one. That's the logical explanation. It happened in other cases. Two of his sons, Servandus and Germanus, are venerated separately at Cadiz, Spain, and have a different feast day. Claudius, Lopercus, and victorious were all canonized as saints. They all died with Marcellus and they have the same feast day as Marcellus, their father, on October 30th. Now here's the kicker. Five out of 12 sons were canonized. What happened to the other seven? What happened to Nona? No further story. They sort of just disappeared. Now remember the story I told you a year ago. I think we were talking about St. Paul Mickey in Japan. And Paul Mickey was crucified with 27 of his followers that all decided that they were going to proclaim Jesus Christ in Japan. And they all got crucified. And they all were canonized. So why didn't they do that here? No answer. But seven of his sons and his wife were not canonized. And no reason is known. Many churches in Spain are today, in fact, still dedicated to Marcellus's sons, including the ancient Benedictine Abbey of San Claudio in the province of Galicia. So what was the result of Marcellus's execution? Well, his story is one of courage, sacrifice, and conviction. It is a true story and one that belongs to all Christians. 
and it's a, a, a true example of real discipleship. Lucius, his fellow soldier, was converted to Christianity by the example set by Marcellus. And many other Christian soldiers at the time rebelled against the Roman Empire. So Marcellus really uh, left a tremendous impact in setting the example of how to behave as a Christian. The official shorthand writer for the Roman court that convicted Marcellus, Saint Cassian, also became a saint and martyr. He was so angry at the sentence that he refused to record the court proceedings. That cost him his life. He was beheaded after Marcellus. So in conclusion, St. Marcellus the Centurion shows us what it entails to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. What we are asked to do. Certainly a display of faith, courage, and conviction. Remember his quote. Christ is my commander now. I will not betray him. He showed us that the world needs to know what each one of us, as Christians, is committed to. Patience, hope, and love. And thirdly, to convert those around us and ultimately the world, we must be, like Marcellus was, a living example of Jesus Christ in everything we do each day. So the questions for the small groups today and uh, for each of the uh, leaders, uh, the questions and little cards are out there uh, under the sign-up sheets. First question is, what is the price of conscience? How far will you, as a Christian, go to be obedient to the teachings and the example of Jesus? Marcellus stood up to the Roman Empire, even though he knew it would cost him his life. How long do you think a faithful witness will be remembered? How many of you before today knew about St. Marcellus the Centurion? So the memory sort of fades away of examples like this. So it's important to keep him in mind and what he did. And the third question is really looking at today. In today's military, priests and Christian ministers are severely restricted in their performance of their Christian duties. The U.S. military. Will they be ultimately judged like Marcellus was? You all know that during the shutdown, there were many priests that volunteered to say Mass without pay because that's their duty for their people. And they were told, even if you get no pay, you will be disobeying orders and you will be sent to jail. That's a fact. Next week, we'll go back to the history of the church. In fact, the next two weeks, uh, Father Mo will be talking about the first Roman persecutions. Amazing story. Thank you very much, and God bless. Are you
Oh, 